Thank you, Basil. And again, uh, first of all, good afternoon or good evening or good morning, because I don't know where I am right now. My time zone is all messed up. So, uh, but it's a pleasure being here. Uh, it is my uh, probably my ninth visit to New Zealand over the last decade, and uh, my second visit to the University of Auckland. Uh, and the last time I was here, I gave a little talk to a group of students who were doing some work with Professor Boyce. And uh, we had some good conversations and discussions. And I was one of those who ventured to disagree with the professor, which you shouldn't do. Uh, but I did, um, and nonetheless, not in a negative way. Just I just had my own thoughts on a couple of things. Uh, but it's, it's a pleasure being here. And I really want to thank uh, Basil. Uh, I think my being here is a testament to the fact that we're in a very hyper-connected wor world. Because uh, when I got the invitation, the email that came first, I was kind of like, New Zealand, University of Auckland. It's not Professor Boyce. So who is this guy? Um, but it turned out that uh, we were connected through a, connect a connection I had from my time uh, when I was doing some work in France, uh, working very closely with folks at the IEA. And it turned out that one of uh, Professor uh, Sharp's student, um, Steve Hyman, who's here, was the one who uh, got me into this uh, trouble, if you may, by suggesting uh, that I, uh, Basil, invite me. And we went back and forth to, to make it work. And we chose perhaps the most interesting month to do this thing, which is the month of November. Uh, October going into November, which means uh, everything I'm about to say here is my view and no one else's view, because I may have to make sure I find my way back into the US after November 8, depending on how things go. Uh, <laughs> but uh, no, no offense. Uh, but but it's, it's, it's great to be here, and, and I love New Zealand. I come here, like I said, quite a bit. Uh, spend a lot of time in, in Wellington for obvious reasons, because that's where you have the, your uh, seat of government, and so I spend some good moments there having discussions about the electricity market and all that good stuff. So today what I'd like to do is to talk about what I call the future of electricity and generation and consumption. And you notice that I left the part in between out of this conversation for a second, which is the, the infrastructure, the grid that connects both sides. Because uh, that would take maybe 10 trips in New Zealand for us to sort of uh, get through that discussion about what it means uh, in terms of the future of the infrastructure. But I want to talk about the generation and consumption side of things, because I think as we look forward to the, the future, uh, those are the two aspects of electricity that will shape how the grid evolves. I always tell people that technology with regards to the grid is not an issue. We can build any sophisticated grid you want. The question is, what do you do with the grid? And what you do with the grid is determined by what happens on the generation side and on the consumption side. And I want to do it in the context of three words. Three words that I think will define uh, the future of electricity. Uh, one is uh, centralized, uh, decentralized, and hyperconnectivity. And as I go through my presentation, you will see why. And typically, when I do these kinds of talks, um, uh, I kind of know the audience very well in the sense that it's either very hyper-academic or is uh, hyper non-academic. Uh, this is a mixed audience. And so I will try to not veer too much into the, the physics that uh, Basil talked about, the physics of the grid. Uh, but bear with me if I do get there. It's just by nature uh, what I do. But I'll try to keep it at a high level. And, um, I want to sort of make this more of an interactive conversation. So I know I have about the next 40 minutes to talk, but if there's a burning question that comes up, if I say something that really gets you disagreeing with what I'm saying or you're very happy about it, you can stand up, clap, but don't throw anything at me because I can't see right now. I'm just too tired. So we got a lot of changes in front of us. And I think as we talk about this issue of the future of electricity, change is something that we'll be grappling with as we go forward. And before I get into that, just one or two slides about the Edison Electric Institute. Uh, we are an institute that was founded about 100 years ago uh, and basically focused on investor-owned utilities in terms of the domestic program, working on policy, working on technology, working on business models, everything that makes investor utilities work, if you may. Uh, we also have an international program, which I run. Uh, the program has about uh, 70 members in about 60 countries. Uh, hence, hence my time zone is, is always messed up because I'm always going to one of those countries. And we have quite a few members in this part of the world, uh, both in New Zealand and Australia. Uh, and there you can see a 
pretty much sort of a global overview of where we have our membership. Uh, and the interesting thing is most of the members around the world are not just investor-owned utilities. Uh, one of the things EI uh, prides itself about is making sure that access to the work of EI is not just constrained to investor-owned utilities. So the international membership uh, consists of both municipalities, uh, government-owned, state-owned utilities, as well as private utilities. So that's sort of a, the two slides about EI. So as we talk about the future, one, of, one thing that is interesting is it's all relative to your time horizon. Uh, some people have a very short time horizon. Um, if you think about the business cycles and you talk to people uh, on the stock market, their time horizon is pretty much the next day with regards to investments and making sure that you're turning around investments you're making. But when we start thinking about something like energy, the time horizon discussion becomes interesting. Because if you take a long time horizon, like a 50-year horizon to a 100-year horizon, it's very easy. Because then you can make all kinds of bold predictions. For one reason, 100 years from now, most of us in this room will not be around. So we can speculate anything we want about the future. No one cares, because we won't be here. But the closer we get to where we live now, in terms of 30 years, 20 years, 15 years, 20 years, 10 years, then it gets a little bit more difficult. Because if I make a prediction today, five years from now, someone in this room is gonna say, Lawrence, you said this and you were wrong. So what we do when it comes to predicting the future, we're very, very, very cautious when it comes to the near-term prediction because we know we don't, get, we don't wanna get it wrong. So we are cautious, we don't wanna take risks, we don't wanna make bold predictions, but this evening we're gonna be very bullish. Uh, we're gonna speculate about both the short term and the long term and some of the things I will say here tonight may sit well with some of you. Uh, in fact, let me just make the normal disclaimer. I'm about to say things that are only my view and not Edison Electric Institute's view, nor are they the views of any of my member companies. So now I'm free to say what I want to say. Uh, but, but that's something to think about, the time horizon. And as we talk about the time horizon, there are a couple of challenges we're facing as a global you know, world energy water, climate, population increase. So these are just four. I mean, sure you can come up with a whole bunch of others, right? So these are sort of a grand challenges that as we think about the future of electricity, we have to think about it in terms of these challenges. And the interesting thing about these four challenges is that they're interrelated. And what's even more interesting is that their interrelationship is dependent on one another in the sense that if one goes up, the other goes up. The more people you have on the planet, the more water they consume, the more water they consume, the more energy they need. So it's a very bad equation. Any mathematician here? So you hear about these sort of non-solve NP problems? Well, there is a non-solvable problem because everything is moving in the same direction. So it makes for chaos because everything is increasing. There's no decrease. Increase energy, increase population, increase impact on the climate, increase need for water. So how do you design a system when everything is increasing? The only way things might decrease in this, con in this construct is if something begins to go down. But the driver for those things going up I may not want them to go down. And the drivers actually are you, me. Because we all want things to keep going up. You know, this constant thing about growth. Everything has to keep growing and growing and growing. So you have this dependency. You need electricity. To have electricity, you need water, right? Well, you need water. To get water, you need electricity. So I'm supposed to balance an equation that will look at these two things, both going up and down, but for one to go up, the other has to go up. If one goes down, the other goes down. If both go down, well, we have an issue because then the economy doesn't go up. So how do you balance that system? How do you predict a future when everything's supposed to go up, but if everything goes up, we end up in chaos? Because everything cannot perpetually go up. <coughs> so creatures are characterized by what they eat. Creatures are characterized by what they eat. And I'm sure you know some of these, you know, carnivore, Omnivore, mescocarnivore, mesocarnivore, hypercarnivore, herbivore, piscivore. And the list goes on. I had to stop because there's so many vores. 
But the interesting thing is, creatures are characterized by what they eat. And so, meet the newest creatures. There are three. They're enivores, they're infovores, and they're aquavores. These are the 21st century humans. And the problem with these new creatures that kind of have all three characteristics is that energy consumption, water consumption, information consumption, that is the hyperconnectivity. They're all connected. And so as we look at designing electricity systems for the future, those three things, those three creatures have to be managed. Now think about this this evening. You are one of those three. In fact, you're all of them. You're both an enivore a word I came up with a couple of years ago when I was so frustrated in trying to understand why humans are so crazy with regards to energy consumption, I made up this word enivore, which is actually not a word, but now it's become a word because I've used it for the, the past five years. And then infovores, right now we have our cell phones, we suck, we consume information beyond our own imagination. We don't even know what we're consuming. We're probably like fat over information. I call it the information fat. The obesity of information. I mean, you all sitting here, and information-wise, we're all obese. Why? I don't know. Try having an information diet for a day. You go crazy. You walk around like you're crazy. Your cell phone is not ringing. Oh my God, no one loves me. And you keep asking for it, not realizing that every time you get a message on your cell phone, there is an energy consumption going on. And the data centers that will serve your information, those data centers that are way in Iceland, sitting somewhere where it's supposed to be cool, well, they need a lot of energy. So you're sitting in New Zealand as an infovore, not realizing that every time you download your email, you're sucking energy from the planet. And by the way, that energy is also sucking water. So that's us, the 21st century humans. And you're asking me as an engineer and other engineers to build an electricity system that will feed you energy, feed you information, and by the way, make sure you can buy clean water whenever you need it. That's a challenge. But the interesting thing is humans are not so dumb. So we've realized that we have to fix this issue of consuming information, water, and energy in a way that will make this planet sustainable in the long run. So we all have these common goals. We go to these meetings like Paris and enjoy caviar and eat uh, you know, foie gras and drink wine and enjoy and come back and we have a common goal. But then we all have different pathways. So again, you're asking me as an engineer and other engineers here to build the electricity system for the future. But we all have different ways to get there. So how do we get to that future? How do we transition from a world of overconsumption of energy, water, and information to a world that will make the future livable for those to come after us? So that brings us to a dilemma. The dilemma, and we can have a dilemma discussion for all three of these different vores, information, water, and energy. Let's focus on energy, because that's closer to electricity. And the dilemma we have is that today, there are about 1.3 billion people in the world who act, lack access to electricity. And we're asking those people to help to keep us under a certain temperature to avoid climate catastrophe. <laughs> But then we're telling those people they should also develop their standard of living. So the dilemma is develop, get out of poverty. But you can only use what we consider to be clean energy. You can use dirty energy because it's not good for the rest of us, but the rest of us have it pretty good. So we can afford to talk about clean energy because we are no longer poor. But if I'm poor, in one of those regions of the world, and I'm looking at the rest of the world that's lit up, I'm like, this makes no sense. You guys here in New Zealand, oh, where is New Zealand? Always oh, lost on my map, but anyway. <laughs> but you guys in New Zealand have it pretty good. It's easy to sit in New Zealand and tell these folks in Africa and in India or in parts of Latin America, you can't, you 
got to use clean energy because it has to be sustainable. But is it economically feasible? And if it's not, again, you're asking me, you're asking engineers, you're asking us to build an electricity system that will provide electricity to the entire world in a way that's sustainable. But what does that do with generation? What fuel source do we use to electrify the world? And in fact, to be a bit provocative, is it even realistic to do? So the transition we're gonna undergo to be able to electrify the world, to build the next generation electricity system, always face two questions. One, is it gonna be evolutionary? Or two, is it gonna be disruptive? Now, economists like, you know, Professor Christensen has this disruptive technology theory, and I think it's great, it makes sense. But then you have the need for stability. So some disruptions are good, but imagine if you disrupted the electricity system because of a transition, and that disruption led to all kinds of chaos in terms of how the grid works, in terms of more people having access to electricity that is not clean, or fewer people having access to electricity because it's too expensive. So you have all these interdependencies. So the question is, do we want the disruption, or you want the transition to be disruptive, or you want it to be evolutionary? Now the system is designed by engineers, is used by consumers, and it's controlled, and it's my, perhaps one of my only provocative thing I will say that may get some people upset. So it's my view to say it's controlled by regulation, code word for politics. So while the citizenry want this disruption to be very, very minimal, we don't want the lights to go off we want it to be nice, so we want a slow evolutionary glide over to this transition of clean energy, low carbon economy. There are others there who want it to be disruptive. Break it up, you know? Get rid of all these monopolies. Get rid of all these things that are standing in the way. Let's just disrupt the whole system. Well, if the disruption affects the average consumer, he's not gonna be happy. So this transition is more driven by technology, it's, not, it's, it's driven by technology, but for the most part there is a political dimension and social dimension and human dimension. So when you ask me to design the grid of the future, I have to ask myself, who's the consumer? What's the fuel source? And who's gonna control it? Because the physics is not a problem. Again, we can design any grid we want, given today's technology or even tomorrow's technology. But the constraints around being able to optimize the consumption I talk about between these enervores, aquavores, and infovores, the constraints around the objective function, sorry, my only mathematical concept here, is posed by policies, regulation, societal needs, society expectation, and that's our problem. So oftentimes when I travel around the world, people say, they're doing it in New Zealand, why can't we do it in America? Or we're doing it in America, why can't you do it in New Zealand? Well, we have to understand that although this transition is global, everyone is talking about it, everyone is thinking about it, everyone is concerned about climate change, these are global concepts. At the end of the day, the implementation has to be seen from a local context, because everything is local. Everything is local. So I'm not one of those who love to sort of just take from one country and bring it to another country. And so you're saying like, well, why don't everyone in Africa just leapfrog to the next generation technology? Well, how are they gonna leapfrog if they don't have some of the basic infrastructure to create leapfrog? And don't get me started with the comparison of electricity and telecom as though they're the same kind of product because everyone will tell you, well, we did it with telecom. Why not leapfrog with electricity? But they're not the same, different contexts. So the transition we're dealing with is, is very, very localized, although the discussions around it might be global. So 
So there are two shifts that are going to occur. The first shift is when I talked about the political, the social, the societal. This list shows you most of the countries in the world that consume or re release the most CO2 emissions. The US, China, India, European Union, Japan, Korea, Brazil. If you feel unhappy, you want to put New Zealand there, feel free, add it to the list. I didn't want to offend you, so I didn't put it there, because I don't think you emit that much. But I could be wrong. Uh, but in any case, what has happened over the last five years? This list, they're changing roles. Because now, the US has actually reduced its CO2 emission over the last couple of years. In fact, China has reduced its CO2 emissions. Now, let's look at India. 320 million people in poverty. And you're telling India, you should not use coal. Okay. But from a political standpoint, I have 320 million people who need to be fed, who need to live the same as you do in New Zealand. So what do they do in India? And the list goes on and on. Japan, Fukushima, shut down nuclear. Okay, let's go to using solar. Oh, uh, well, no, it's not useful. useful. Let's step back and let's go back to nuclear. Uh, Korea, we don't have a lot of resources. We have to import a lot of resources to fuel our economies. Get to the Middle East, get to Africa. So the first phase shift is not so much of technology, it's more of a political, it's a societal. The mindset has to change in terms of what we're asking people to do with regards to electricity. So we have to shift, and the shift will bring about some of these changes. Then the second shift, which is perhaps the most difficult one, is shifting how we fuel our economies. Coal is what we've used for decades. And according to the IEA, we'll continue to use coal. Good or bad, again, if you're looking at a five-year horizon, a hundred-year horizon, you may have a different perspective. But the fact of the matter is, if you're in a country that only has coal, and you have 300 million people who are poor, well, you have to get them out of poverty. Natural gas, we have an abundance in North America now, thanks to something that most people don't like, which is called fracking. Well, not all fracking is always bad. And I, I was interviewed in New Zealand a couple of years ago, and I was asked a question, and I see my old friend, my good friend Kevin Hart here. He, uh, I was in, in the studio being interviewed by uh, uh, Mr. Chris Ladlor, and, and we started the interview very nicely, and, and Chris kind of pulled a fast one on me because we're supposed to talk about renewables, and Chris said, oh, Dr. Jones, tell us, what do you think of fracking? And I could see Kevin through the window, because we were working for the same company at the time, and he was like, don't answer that question, please don't. But knowing how dumb I was, I did answer the question. <laughs> and, um, and Chris didn't like my answer, because what I said to Chris was I said, well, every time you try to extract something from the, from the earth, things can go wrong, but sometimes things don't go wrong at all. And so when we're done, he looked at me and said, you're not an engineer, more or less, you're a politician. And I said, you asked me a political question, so I gave you a political answer. Because clearly, asking me what I think of fracking wasn't supposed to be part of the conversation. But today, because of you know, hydraulic fracking, America has an abundance. Now, has there been a few incidents? I don't know. Has there been nothing? Maybe not. What I do know is that that technology change has changed the dynamics of energy in the United States. Nuclear. Oh my God, why should I use the word nuclear in New Zealand? But I'm using it here because China is building 50 new nuclear power plants as we speak. We want them to not use coal. But if they don't use coal and they have a billion people to provide energy to, what options do they have? So again, the choices, the shift, can't just happen in a vacuum. Because these things have consequences. Hydro, Brazil, Africa, don't touch your hydro resources because it's not good for the environment. OK, fine. I only have hydro. What else am I supposed to do? I have a billion people who need electricity. Should I not develop my hydro? Wind. Wind is great. Try landing in Wellington. You realize how wind is great. Um, or even leaving Wellington because I've been stuck there a couple of times, can't get out of the place because of the wind. Wind is great. Subsidies for wind was great, 
But do you keep it perpetually? Or do you remove subsidy and let wind fend for itself, like they've done in Denmark? Solar. Well, is this thing that's supposed to revolutionize the world? And I was born and grew up in West Africa, and I must tell you, I believe that the sun shines quite a bit in West Africa. But I can also tell you that if you're going to industrialize West Africa, no amount of rooftop solar is going to industrialize West Africa. So I have a problem. If I use only solar, and I'm supposed to build factories in Africa to become competitive with folks in New Zealand, how do I do it? So none of these things here are the panacea to our problem. We're going to need a sort of a, a grouping, a collection of different solutions. But picking one and saying this is the only thing, in my view, is a mistake. And trying to dictate to the world that this is the one that we should all use is also a mistake. So we can't place all our bets as we transition to a clean energy economy on one. We need a group of multiple of these different things. We need a mixture. We need a sort of a diversity of solutions to be able to get us where we want to get to. So what are some trends that will shape, given the, cons the, uh, the supply mix we just talked about, what are some of the things that are affecting how, as I look into the future and look at electricity, things that I think about? Urbanization, a very good thing, perhaps. But explain to me from planet Mars, why you people on this Earth believe it's best and is the most resilient solution for all of you to live on the coast, for all of you to live in these very congested places called cities, when God has given you this vast land all over the planet. But for some reason, we must just all live in these very congested places called cities. Not that it's bad. I know economists hate when I talk about this because they say, well, cities will drive the development because economies of scale. Yeah, I understand that. But cities also have a, a lot of risk. In fact, one of the reasons why decentralized solutions will not work is because you have these huge urban cities that cannot be supplied electricity from decentralized sources. Find me a rooftop solution in Paris, in Mumbai, in Lagos. But you were telling me I should just Decentralize, okay, I will decentralize, but if I do, how do I fuel these large mega urban cities? Digitization, hyperconnectivity. We're living longer, a great thing. I'm so happy. My mom is gonna be 100 one of these days. I'll be so fantastically glad when she turns 100. But not everyone will be, because some people realize that the longer people live, our economic system wasn't designed for people to live long. Sad to say, but that's a reality. The assumption around pension plans where that people will live until they reach a certain age and then they will die. Well, guess what? Technology has extended the lifespan of people. So now the system is in shock because before, the amount of consumers were supposed to stop at a certain point. Well, they're now extending. They're crossing over. So the more people are consuming is because few people are dying compared to what we had expected, which is a great thing. But that poses a challenge. We've already talked about consumption. And by the way, we do not have infinite resource. Perhaps one would say, the sun is the most infinite resource we have. And I don't disagree. But how do you harness it in a way that will bring about the developments we've talked about? Global governance structure. Why does that affect electricity systems? Well, you realize, like I already said, it's not the technology that drives how we design electricity systems. How we run them is oftentimes constrained by the political realities in which, within which we operate. And then I call this cyber insecurity, because everybody talks about cyber security. I prefer cyber insecurity, because we're all cyber insecure. How many people you have a cell phone right now that is on? Great, so you all have just been hacked by my question. <laughs> because the reality is, we're insecure. Hyperconnectivity is great. But with that comes a lot of risk. And until we learn how to harness that risk, we are, we're, we're going to be insecure. So centralization has a lot of benefits. Urbanization, smart cities, that's why we centralize. Data platforms, Google, Facebook, those are centralized platforms. No one complain about it. Uh, open innovation, great. When you centralize things, we can share information. 
Central banks, it's a centralized thing by the nature of the name, central bank. We need central banks because without central banks, we cannot avoid some of these economic catastrophes. If you're going to scale up renewables and really scale it up, you need centralized power plants, large solar plants, large wind plants. But they're going to have to be centralized and large if you're going to really have an impact. And industrialization. You can't industrialize a country with decentralized solutions. Imagine 50 years ago, if New Zealand didn't build a single centralized power station, if everybody had their own rooftop solar, I can guarantee you, you will not be where you are today with your GDP. Because you need scale. You need centralization. But you also need decentralization. Because centralized systems have an intrinsic property of being not oftentimes resilient. You take it out, the rest of the system is out. So decentralization is great because it adds some resilience. It gives some independence. It helps innovation because if everything is centralized, somehow it stymies innovation. Sometimes it's good to be the wonky guy sitting in a place by yourself thinking and not talking to a bunch of other people. It's not a bad thing. It reduces system failures. But in the context of electrification, decentralization is very important because we have about a billion people in the world who live in rural communities who need access to electricity. And we shouldn't make the mistake and force them to live in urban communities because that will only exacerbate the problem. We should find a way to make what I call de-urbanization work through, through decentralization. It should be okay to live in the rural communities. One thing I like about New Zealand, whenever I come here, most people I know who may live in the city, they take a boat to go somewhere, live in another little village, even though you know, Wellington is still getting congested. I was walking there yesterday, I'm like, oh my God, I can't, I can't find my way around this place. Uh, I never did it in the first place, but it's even getting worse now when I, when I go there. So decentralization is not a bad thing. So we're now entering this new age. I call it the age of hybridity. Again, not a word. It was never a word until I used it. So you notice that Lawrence creates words because that's how we innovate. We come up with concepts and let those concepts become sort of a, the foundation for going forward. So this notion of hybridity, hybrid systems, where we'll have both centralized and decentralized, that's where I think we're going. But the challenge is that the political reality within which these systems must work are not moving along with the same change. Because think about a hybrid government, right? Most governments are either centralized or quasi-centralized. But now you're telling them to be hybrid. What the heck does a hybrid government do? Well, I can give you one example. A hybrid government could be a government where you put a ministry in every city not in the big city. So you have maybe the Minister of Finance in Oakland, you have the Minister of Energy in Wellington, you have one in Hamilton, just decentralized. It's still a centralized government. Why you can do that is because of hyperconnectivity. There's no need to have all the ministries in the same city. There's absolutely no need. You can pretty much in the next decade, you can beam yourself into a city and have a conversation. You can use virtual reality and have a meeting. So why do we still need all these centralized government structures. So we're asking politicians, we together, to create a new reality, a hybrid regulatory system, a hybrid political system that will allow us to deal with both centralized and decentralized solutions. There is no one size fit all. And I say this because mixing politics, regulation, and economics with the laws of physics and I didn't say physics, I actually put all these physicists because I like to put their names, so it makes me look smart. Uh, Kirchhoff, Voltaire, Ampere, Moore, Metcalf, these are all physicists. You take their theories and combine them with policy regulation and economic theory, sometimes you end up with chaos. Because when you try to make physics, box physics into these regulatory policy and economic theories, and they don't work, what you do, you force engineers to make things work to make politicians, economists, or lawyers happy. I have a joke where I always say, take me and put me in a room with a bunch of lawyers, and I give them one sentence and say, this is the sentence to regulate, or this is the sentence about how I'm gonna operate a power system. When they come back, they will have given me five 
hundred more sentences for that one sentence. I'm a little exaggerating, but you got the point. So we need to be careful when we take a physical system like the electricity grid, where we have transition occurring on the supply side and the generation on and the consumption side, and then we say, let it work within this political framework. And so you force engineers to do something with a system that wasn't designed to do these things to support the economic theory or the political theory or the legal framework. And that is one of the challenges we have with regards to electricity, is that we're being asked to do a lot of things with electricity that the physics cannot just be defied. And we've seen examples around the world where when these things don't match well, sometimes they do work well. I must admit, you've gotten it right in New Zealand at times, but again, like every one of us, you've gotten it wrong at times too. So you can't mix the three. And the other thing, and, and you, our friend here who's an electricity market designer, we try to design markets for a commodity that is not a normal commodity. Electricity is not like water. I cannot sell you one glass of electricity. I could, but I will be fooling you. I can't. So if I'm trying to create market for something that's not a real commodity, I can't even store it today. So if I can't store it, well, the economic theory become a little bit tricky. So electricity is a peculiar commodity. You know? And the thing about it is, it's only valuable when it's not there. So when the lights are off, everybody will do everything to pay to have the lights come back on. And once it comes back on, the price must go down. Now, it's weird, because if you ask everybody in this room, what's the most important commodity they need every day when they get home? It's light, it's electricity, it's power. But then you are told that it should be affordable. So you prefer to spend $1,000 on your cell phone bill, but you only want to pay a dollar for electricity. That's strange. But that's the reality, and that's the challenge facing the electricity sector, is that we have a commodity that is only valuable when it's not there. And in fact, when it's not there, we're blamed. We're saying, it's your guy's fault. You know, the, the, the regulatory framework, the political framework, whatever, tells us, make this system work a certain way. Do this, do that. And when things go wrong, it's still your fault, even though I told you to do it. So you create electricity markets, but in fact, Electricity is not a normal commodity. So how do you design a system for the future for something that is not a real commodity? Let's talk briefly about investments. As much as electricity is so important, do you know that in the great United States of America, there was a study some time ago that showed that there was more investment made in R&D in dog food than in energy. <clears throat> Think about it. So we, the collective we, because I can ask the same question, how much does New Zealand invest in energy R&D? Not much, I would guess, because globally it's less than 2%. This is the most important thing we need to fix the world, to fuel the world, to end poverty, and we're only investing 2% of whatever is in it? Now you can blame anybody, you can blame the government, you can blame the private sector, the fact of the matter is, if this thing is so important, why are we not investing in it? My theory is, we as engineers are very dumb. What we've done is we've designed something so robust that provides so much, so great reliability, 99.99999, that to tell you that we need more money to make it another nine, Better? No, doesn't make sense. So we're stuck. There's so much that we need to do with the electricity system. There's so much innovation that needs to occur, but nobody believes us because the lights are on all the time. And if the lights do go off, oh, you guys did it on purpose. <laughs> so the innovation that we see coming that will shape the consumption patterns, that will shape how we design systems, that will shape the generation, the supply side, material science, sensors. Everything is sensed today. This whole hyperconnectivity is driven by everything being sensed. Everything is being controlled. I mean, you fly the Boeing or Airbus airplane and you realize how things are. I mean, everything is just great. 
we, everything is controlled. In fact, we don't realize we ourselves were controlled, you know, because you have a cell phone, which means everywhere you go, I can track you. You have a TV that's supposed to be smart TV. <laughs> you don't realize that in that TV is a chip that's telling me when you went to sleep. Shh, I didn't tell you that. But anyway, artificial intelligence. We're getting to the place where Siri in Google and their equivalent is sort of an assistant that will tell you where you're going, you're sick. Lawrence, you have 50 minutes left to talk. You have all these intelligent, artificial intelligence stuff that is really gaining momentum. That's going to really change how we live. Computational science. Now we can test and retest and experiment using simulation in ways we could have never imagined. All of this bodes well for how we design energy systems. All of this bodes well for how we do manufacturing. We start looking at things like 3D printing. All of this will bring about change. But interestingly enough, all of these things also require energy. In fact, computational science, the faster we compute, the more power we need to compute even faster and faster and faster. But innovation has to occur. And so the hyperconnectivity is a topic that is on everyone's mind as we look at innovation. There is a chart that's a little bit, this, this graph, a little bit confusing here because what it is is we had a, a session at EI <coughs> few years ago where we brought executives in the room and said let's talk about connectivity and these are some of the words that came up as we discussed connectivity how we're so connected <coughs> and I think connectivity is a good thing when we think about electricity but it's also a good thing when we think about how we solve the problems that we're facing in the world and this sort of a this is sort of a executive thoughts on how we discuss and talk about a con connectivity so the other thing about this equation, the equation of generation, supply, let's forget about the grid for a moment, <coughs> brings us to the supply side when it comes to do with the consumer. We've gone from this notion that we had only three types of consumers, commercial, residential, and industrial. That's how we're classified. But now, because of innovation, because of connectivity, because of wireless connectivity, because of all kinds of things, we're now entering an age where everything is individualized. And that's one of the reasons why everybody wants their own rooftop TV, because everyone is thinking, I can stand on my own two feet. But the day the sun doesn't shine, I want the utility to be there. And by the way, even if I were to buy an energy storage, I'll still need to charge that storage device to make it available. So somehow I still <coughs> need my grid. So you have all these new types of customer services emerging because sometimes we look at what's happening on the telecom side and say, why can't we do the same thing on the electricity side? And so you have all these needs for these different services. But I go back. I cannot sell you a glass of electricity. So. What am I supposed to commoditize? What am I supposed to personalize for you, the consumer? Well, if I'm an electricity company, that I'm selling electricity, and I can't commoditize this, and you're telling me you want services, then I have to come up with services. Well, if I did come up with services, those services have to be legal within the framework of how the system works. So the policymakers and the regulators will have to tell me, Lawrence, you can now not only sell electricity, you have to offer certain services. So my business model will have to change. I will have to come with a whole new way of offering these services and monetizing these services to meet your demands. <coughs> Energy management system in the home, building management systems, all of these things will mean different kinds of services. So I'm moving from selling kilowatt hour to selling kilowatt hour enabled services. But I'm not allowed to do it today because that's not how the legal framework is set up. So I'm going to have to change that to be able to offer these services. Transportation electrification, perhaps one of the hottest topics in the industry today. For many reasons, whether it's in China, in Canada, in parts of the US, in Europe, electrification of transportation is gaining momentum. Price of batteries continue to go down. And most people see this as one way to address the emissions issues is by electrifying transportation, which is great. 
But here's again, go back to the beginning of one of my slides. Where do I get the electricity from? Do I get it from coal? Do I get it from nuclear? Can I charge my car using my rooftop PV? Or do I need to go and charge somewhere else? So this is great. I think it's going to happen. I think it's coming. It's going to be a major trend. It's going to break from being just a trend to be an actual status quo in the next 5, 10, 15 years. But we have to think about how do we fuel these cars? So it's a trade-off. I can have less carbon emissions, CO2 emissions from cars, but then I can allow a little bit more from my power plants, but I can't do both, right? If I'm not gonna use gasoline to fuel my car, I'm gonna have to use electricity. If I'm gonna use electricity, I can't just rely on renewables because I need to have enough to do all of this stuff. Energy storage, the other ne next topic that everyone is talking about. And when you talk to people, what I like about talking to people who are not entrenched in all the policy and techno technical issues around electricity, they will hear on the news, energy storage is great, we can do it. And then they'll tell you, I have this friend who will always say to me, Lawrence, why we can't do this? And like, can we do that? Yeah, where, where did you hear it from? I heard it on the radio. So we hear these things and we actually believe it to be true because if the engineers tell you it, they might not be telling you the truth, right? So you don't believe the engineer who actually knows what he's telling you. I said something the other day, I said doctors are very great. Doctors, you tell, if he tells you you're sick, you never ask the doctor why I'm sick. You just say, make me a cure, heal me quickly. When an engineer tells you you have a problem, you tell him, why do I have a problem? It's a problem because I know more than you do because this is my field of specialty, right? So energy storage, yes, it, it will happen. Are we there yet? No. Will it take time? Yes. Does it require more R&D? It sure does. But what would that mean for the grid? And by the way, energy storage is not just what happens in your home if you have a, have a little storage device in your home. This thing called electricity, Everyone here who uses a hairdryer tomorrow morning should realize that if the machine, the motor doesn't turn, it's probably because you have a problem because you don't have enough pressure, quote unquote, or we call it voltage on the electricity side, that's pushing up the system to give you enough pressure to turn that hairdryer. Right, now, many people don't realize that when you pay for electricity, you oftentimes pay for so-called energy but you don't pay for this energy that's called reactive energy, which is the sort of energy that produces pressure. You only pay for what is called good energy or what is called megawatt hour. So in essence, the engineers, the engineers have designed a system where the thing that is most valuable for your hair dryer, you're not paying for it. You need voltage to make sure you dry your hair in the morning. If there's anything you should remember from this conversation is tell your friend, your husband, your spouse, if my hair dryer isn't working, it's because you haven't paid for the voltage to the utility. But you do have storage for reactive power. They're called capacitor banks. These things that store reactive power. But guess what? We don't monetize it today. Because to do that, oh my goodness, it's going to be too complicated to design a monetary system where people pay for reactive power. So we don't today, which is a mistake. We should. We, we don't. So energy storage is not just here, it's along the entire value chain. So we see it taking off in the US, we see it taking off here. Um, let me, I wanna just get to a few slides before we take some questions here. This issue of modernizing the grid. We need the grid. We've talked about generation, we've talked about the supply side, but you have to connect those two. Even if you had a microgrid, that microgrid needs to have a couple of wires to connect your home to the microgrid. So you can't get away from infrastructure. And the paradigm here with these eight uh, blocks, if you may, are now what we see as the building blocks for how you design and modernize electricity systems in a way that will deal with the regulation, the policy, the economics, the cybersecurity, the customer, the visibility that is needed to keep the lights on, how you operate these systems, and as we think about designing systems, we can no longer take a singular view to the problem where we only look at the policy. We need to take a holistic view of it. 
which means how we plan future electricity systems will have to look at the pricing model. Why are we not pricing electricity reactive power? Tomorrow, do me a favor. Call your utility and ask them. Tell them, I would like to pay for reactive power. And if they ask you why, tell them, because if I did, I will be guaranteed I will have more pressure, I will have more voltage to support my hair dryer. Okay? Do that. Okay? Interoperability. Make sure that when you talk to a utility or when you talk to your policymaker, that all these systems can communicate. They can interoperate. Because if they don't, we're entering a world where cybersecurity can creep up and affect us in different ways if we don't think about how you protect interoperable systems. So we've talked about this transition. We've talked about how you go about dealing with the economics of it, looking at the situation where new business models will evolve, the customer's expectations. Everybody wants clean energy, but not realizing that perhaps clean energy, while it may be good in a local context in one country, may not make sense in another country just because of the practical reality. How do you achieve resilience? So you need to sort of think holistically about this transition and what it means. And that brings me to the last point, which is value. Oftentimes when we talk about electricity, we always talk about the price, the cost. Very seldom do we talk about the value. Remember I said, we have the most important commodity that is only valuable when it's not there. So now, as we talk about this transition, we're facing a situation where whether it's evolutionary or disruptive, value is going to somehow be impacted. And the question is, how do we make sure that the value of the grid, the value of having an infrastructure that connects consumers to suppliers, that value is not destroyed when we go about this transition. So we don't want to destroy the value, we want to create new value. But creating new value is tricky because it means someone is gonna to have to lose and someone is gonna to have to win or we can play in the sandbox together. Some people win some, some people win a little bit more but no one loses completely. And that's our challenge. So the last thing here about technology which relates to this thing of value is the internet of things. Again, one of those things that started in another industry Everyone hears about it, it's great. Let's have the internet of things for the power grid. It brings all these benefits, observability, controllability, connectability, flexibility, all sounds great. But how do you make it work in reality? When you connect these different devices, for example, I was talking about it yesterday, how do you monetize the actions doing, that is carried out by these different devices? So there are a couple of examples, it's happening. In, in the US, in California, they're now talking about the grid of things. Connectivity is there. It doesn't have to be called the internet of things where every little home device is gonna be connected to one another. We already have, we've already had a grid of things. We've already had interconnectivity. This is nothing new. So pj and &E has this lab where they're looking at putting things together. Your neighbor, Australia, they're experimenting with this too where they're looking at you know, the idea of internet of things, connecting different homes and allowing these homes to, to sort of a tap into the market and, and, and be part of this ecosystem. Lighting system today can be part of this internet of things. Transportation system. All of these things coming together creates value. The question is, how do you share the value <laughs> along the value chain? In the past, you had one company that supplied your electricity. You still have the same demand. Now you want 50 companies. So I just asked a simple math. Does it make sense? I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but just look at the equation. If you still want one ampere in your home, and now instead of getting it from one person, you're getting it from 50 people, someone is losing money somewhere. And guess who? Most likely it's you. So Ergon Energy, they're doing some stuff there in Australia. This idea of smart functions, smart homes. This is the one I like, you know, because people say smart homes, you know, and I come back to my mom. She's almost, well, I can say it. She's not, well, it's fine. She's almost 80, so she'll not be mad at me saying she's 80. 
When you, turn, when you turn 80, you're very proud because you've lived such a good life, right? So you say you're 80. If I said to my mom she was 40 when she was 40, she would get mad at me. But when she's 80, she's just happy to be 80. But people say my mom needs a smart home. And she's like, no, I just want the lights to come on when I want it on. I don't need all these gadgets. I want it simple, convenient. I don't want all this stuff. So what has happened is because a few people, a few smart, savvy people, many of us in this room, we like all this technology stuff, we then are the ones who want to drive the rest of the consumers to, be, to think they need smart home, when in fact they don't. So then you ask them to design a system that will only benefit 10% of the people. But the remaining, all the people here who are over 60 and 70 and 80, I won't ask you to raise your hands, but, but all those people who don't need those sophisticated systems, they're still paying for it. So how is that fair? that I'm going to design a system that will only benefit 10% of the consumers, but everyone else has to pay. So that thing about grid pricing, the structure of the pricing, how we price electricity and the services, that has to change. So ladies and gentlemen, the choices we're going to make will have consequences for not just the value chain and how value is created along the grid. Those 5, 10, 15 years, the choices we make today will shape what happens. So there are trade-offs we're going to have to make if we're going to reach, and I say, a near zero carbon world because we're never going to get to 100% carbon neutral world. It's impossible. I don't think it's feasible in our lifetime. Not in my lifetime, not in my children's lifetime, not even in my grandchildren's lifetime. So let's just accept it that we're never going to get to a 100% zero carbon world. Now, I'm, I'm sure there are people here who disagree with me, and tomorrow the newspaper ambassador will say, Dr. Lawrence Jones said we'll never get to a zero carbon world. If you can tell me how it works, how it's going to make sense financially, societal, from a societal standpoint, I would agree with you, but I just don't see how it's going to happen. We can get to near zero, but to get to ultimate zero, that's not possible because we have to make choices. And the biggest thing behind not making it work is the lack of trust, because we don't trust each other. We don't trust each other in families. We don't trust each other in countries. We don't trust each other in the world. We lack trust. And until we can fix the trust factor to realize that it's OK for India to use coal to get their people out of poverty, and it's OK for us in New Zealand to have our electricity bill go up a little bit so we can use some of that money to support research that will benefit people in India and Africa. Or that people in India and Africa should leapfrog to clean technology. We have to trust that until we do this together collectively as a world, we're not going to solve this problem. So in fact, you can shut down all the coal fire plants in a country and buy all the solar technology from China manufactured with coal fire plants. And what you would have done, nothing to the ecosystem because guess what, it's one world and what goes in has to come out. So at the end of the day, we have to fix the trust factor. So I'll end with this quote from Thomas Edison. That vision without execution is nothing but hallucination. We're very great as a world, as a people, to have vision. All kinds of visions. I've read so many vision statements, I'm, going, I'm losing my head now. But the execution is lacking. And so we did pass, a, we had a Paris Agreement. Everybody signed it. At least most people did who were there. The question is, how do we execute? Because if we don't, again, we'll still be dreaming. Thank you. <laughs>